Hello, this is Professor George Easton, and this video is part one of my two-part introduction to R notebooks. In this first part, I provide some background that will help you put R notebooks in context and will give you a much deeper understanding of the point of R notebooks and similar notebook-like approaches. The part two video of this series will demonstrate using RStudio to create R notebooks and some of the basic syntax of how to use them. But I strongly recommend that you take the time to learn the background presented in this video before you get, in a sense, lost in the actual details of creating R notebooks. Before I start to tell you about literate programming in R notebooks, I wanted to make sure that you know that this video has a home page at my website datasciencesource.com. The video is embedded on that page. The link is shown on the screen and the case of the letters in our notebook's intro matters, so please be careful about that. But on this page you'll find additional information and also links to source code and any data used in this video. So I recommend that you start with that page and that you launch the video from there. Our notebooks is an implementation of the idea of literate programming. And I want to spend a little time telling you about literate programming because it will give you some context for understanding the development of our notebooks. Without this context, it might be more difficult to really get the point of what our notebooks and things like our notebooks are really trying to do. The idea of literate programming was created by Donald K. Newth. And the seminal publication of this idea is the book Literate Programming, which was published in 1991. So these ideas have been around for a while. The basic idea of literate programming is that the process of writing, debugging, and perhaps documenting the code is no longer viewed separately from the process of developing a manuscript which is based on that code which is either discussing that code or discussing the results of that code as would be the case in a statistical analysis. So that means that what you're really trying to do here is to integrate the development of text and by text here I don't just mean characters like in a text file I mean text like in a textbook but to integrate the development of that text and the code that goes with it in such a way that the programming is more natural so this actually aids in the code development. The document, this manuscript, and the code are developed in parallel instead of as in separate phases. The code is well explained, so the code ends up being well documented. The results that are produced by running the code are more easily and naturally communicated. So again here we're thinking about something like the results of a statistical analysis. And finally, the results and the publication document, this manuscript, are automatically produced. So here is the old way that things generally went prior to the ideas of literate programming. You began with some kind of idea, concept, or goal. For me as a professor, I might be trying to write a research paper on a particular topic, and I would have some kind of general idea of what kind of code I was going to need to produce in order to get the results that would be the basis of that paper. But you basically start with some kind of idea, concept, or goal, and then you write and debug the code that is going to be the basis for the final product. Hopefully while you're writing the code you'll also be doing some documentation of that code, but eventually when you finish the code you're also going to finish the documentation that is within the code. The next thing you do is run the code to get your final results. And I've put quotes around final here because these do not end up being your final results as you might have suspected. Once you have your results, you then start drafting the manuscript. But then, typically, you would need to manually copy or transcribe all of the results or the code into the manuscript that you have written. This is a very error-prone process. 
even when you are copying and pasting either the results or the code from the output from the program. It is very, very easy to do that cutting and pasting incorrectly, but the more common error is that something that should have gotten copied and pasted doesn't. But then it's very likely that you're going to find that there's some kind of problem or other reason that you need to change the manuscript and the code. So this happens many, many times for many reasons. When you actually get into writing the descriptions of certain things, you realize you need to run it a different way. And of course, in the case of a research paper, there's the refereeing process. But you inevitably get to this box where the final results in manuscript are not okay anymore and you're going to need to change it. So at that point, you go back in and you edit and then rerun the code. And then you edit the manuscript so that it is consistent with either this new code or the results of the new code. And then you have to go back to manually copying all these new results and code into the manuscript. This again is very error prone. But it just doesn't happen one time. Usually this happens many times. In the course of the referee process of a paper, a research paper will generally go through more than one cycle with the referees. But for any complex project, even without referees, you're very likely to find that there are many cycles of needing to change things, both the manuscript and the code, in order to get new results as a result of either errors or things that need to be done in a better way or with a different perspective or shading and so on. Now I want to emphasize that this error prone step of manually copying the results in the code is much more complex than that box tends to imply. So manually copying the results in code actually means that you firstly manually copy any figures, plots, graphs, etc into the manuscript. In many cases, the figure titles and captions that go with those figures are not part of the figures themselves that are produced by the code, but they're rather in the manuscript. So you have to go into the manuscript and make sure that all the figure captions and everything else now corresponds to the new figures. And then those figures are typically referenced from at least one, and in many cases, multiple places inside the manuscript. And those figures are typically referenced at least once in the manuscript and sometimes many times. So you have to go in and make sure that the sentences and discussion around those figures now actually reflects what the new figures look like. Not only do you have to do this with the figures, you have to do it with the tables. And you have exactly the same set of issues. Your software may produce the tables, but the Table titles and captions are oftentimes part of the manuscript and not part of the table that's produced by the software. And then, of course, those tables are referenced. And you have to go back into the text to make sure that the discussion within the text now corresponds to what those tables actually look like. And then finally, you may very well have specific values somewhere in the text or snippets of code or other things. So you have to manually copy that data or those code fragments into the text and then again edit the text around those new code fragments or data values so that the language is consistent with what's actually there after the revision. Now in literate programming you start with the same idea, concept, or goal and a conceptualization of what kind of code that you're going to need to uh, support that. And then what you do is you write and debug the text. And again here I mean text as in like a textbook, the manuscript, and the code together in chunks. And this helps both the writing of the manuscript and the writing of the code. Doing the two together is very likely to uncover early on issues that normally would not be uncovered until much later. So you might iterate going through both the development of the manuscript and code in multiple chunks, or what is more typical of my own work pattern would be to write a chunk and then automatically produce the results in the document. And this is very important because the automatic step here not only executes the code, but also produces the results and puts those into the formatted document. So I would tend to have many cycles where I'm writing and debugging a chunk of manuscript and code and then producing the results and cycling. 
But eventually you get back to the situation where, oops, something's wrong and some kind of change is required. So in this literate programming paradigm, you're going to go and edit the chunk of text and code that's affected, or maybe there's more than one chunk, but then the literate programming system is going to automatically produce the new results and the document. So it completely eliminates the manual copying of the results of the code into the manuscript and structures things in such a way that the manuscript and the code chunks are being developed essentially in parallel. Now this cycle of discovering that there are problems and things that need to be changed and then editing code chunks and automatically producing the new results in document are likely to happen many, many times in the literate programming paradigm as well. But the literate programming paradigm has eliminated a lot of work and potential errors as a result of manually copying results and code snippets into manuscripts and in addition has structured the task in such a way that the manuscript and the code chunks are being written more or less at the same time and this actually facilitates the writing of both. So having introduced the idea of literate programming I'm now going to turn attention to our notebooks and again our notebooks are an implementation of the ideas of literate programming. In our notebooks the text part, the manuscript part, is written using a simple formatting language called R Markdown. R Markdown it turns out is a slight extension of another language called Markdown and I provided in the slides a link to the main source of documentation and so on for Markdown. Markdown is a particular syntax of what are known as markup languages. And what markup languages do is provide a language and syntax for specifying the format of a document. And probably the best known one of these is HTML, which is Hypertext Markup Language which of course is the main language for creating web pages and the markup language part of that is how you specify the formatting of the document. The name markdown is a play on words playing of course against markup in markup languages and markdown is designed to be simple but more importantly to be human readable before formatting. As you know if you've done work with HTML it can be quite difficult to figure out exactly what's going on in the document without actually pulling it up in a browser so you can actually see the formatted text. But Markdown is designed to be readable before the formatted document is produced. In addition to Markdown being used as the basis for our notebooks, Markdown is often used also in readme files and for formatting form messages. So knowing a little bit of Markdown is a good idea. Now our notebooks consist of three types of sections. There is a configuration header written in something called YAML. And I really don't want to focus on this too much right now because it's not a major part of the R notebooks. But what YAML is used for is to assign options and parameters that are going to control the automatic document production and this is done via key value pairs. The next type of section are text sections which are written in our markdown. So they should not only be readable by humans in their code form but also then produce the formatted document after they have been processed. And the last type of sections are code sections, and there are really two issues with respect to code sections. One is formatting them for inclusion in the final manuscript if that's desired, but the other thing is that they need to be executable so that their results can be provided in the manuscript. For us, these code sections are going to be written in R, but actually the code can be written in other languages as well and these code sections specify the language that should be used to execute them as you'll see in a moment when we actually start looking at an R notebook file. So this concludes part one, the introduction and background for R notebooks. In the part two video, 
I will show you how to use RStudio to create R notebooks, and then we'll go through some of the basic syntax in using them.